I wanted to mention before we close that, you know, we're talking about certain types that you need to maintain. And you need to maintain the types because God created the wild type, okay? And uh, I'm a believer in God. Okay, so, but the wild type is within our birds. And our birds want to stretch out and become these ugly things that we see in the streets. And we have to continuously uh, keep that in mind and watch the birds as they try to go back to what evolution tells them to go back to. And we need to uh, fight against that and keep the, the, the basic roller type always. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Roller Pigeon Evolution. We took a road trip today. We're here with a really great friend of mine. His name is Richard Apodaca, a serious roller man. Mm -hmm. So we came to his house today, and we're going to do a little video, and we're going to watch some of his birds fly. And then we're going to sit down, and we're going to talk about the Apodacian theory. This is what I call it. <laughs> which is uh, which is a really interesting theory, and what it is, it's how he breeds his birds and his whole theory behind how he got to where he is today. So, come along for the ride, and let's check out some roll.
So, once again, everybody, thanks for tuning in for another edition of Roller Pigeon Evolution. This is the first in a series that we're going to be doing called Bird's Eye View. And what we're going to be doing on this series is talking to the pros, talking to the guys that are the movers and shakers in this hobby, guys that have made their mark, and we want to know how they did it and uh, how we can do it. So I want to introduce you, or should I say reintroduce you to a good friend of mine, Richard Apodaca. And uh, we're going to be having some conversations about his birds, about his theory, about what I call the Apodacan theory, and um, how he uh, came up with it and what it entails. So hang on for the ride. And Richard, say hi to, to all of our guests out there. Hello, everybody. So Richard, uh, we, we watched Richard's birds fly today, and I've watched his birds fly several times, and I've been thoroughly impressed with a couple things about his birds. And one of the things that really impressed me that is near and dear to my heart is speed. The velocity that his birds roll with. And overall, uh, something that we all try to achieve is making sure that our birds roll at a high velocity. So Richard, tell me, um, how did you do that? How did you get them to do what they're doing now? That's a hard question to answer right off. You know, mm -hmm. but. Uh... When I first started, I had I had a bird that I got from Baldwin Park Feed. From actually, my son got it for me, mm -hmm. and I made it to a bird that I got from Homer Coderre because we had become friends, and that pair clicked, and it was an accidental mating. Mm -hmm. I had no knowledge what I was doing, and all of a sudden, everybody said the Apodacas Black Badge family. And then I took took a Paul Platt's cock mm -hmm. that was out of the Jackanet family, and I made it that into that family, and it produced more speed, and it was a real muscular cock. So I told my when son, you say when you when you say a, not to interrupt but when you say a muscular cock, what do you mean? Just that that the cock was real strong. So you're looking at the body type, and that body type, and the way that bird was constructed had a lot of muscle on it. Yes. Okay. Now, muscle is important for what? For speed. Huh. Muscle is important for speed. So take note. When you want to produce birds that have speed, muscle is very important. Why? Well, <laughs> I don't I don't know how to answer that one. So, so let me break it down for you because it's kind of a rhetorical question. Mm -hmm. But the reason muscle is important for speed, you got to realize these birds that we raise are athletes. In order for an athlete to perform the given task, you have to have muscle. You have to have an engine, per se, that drives the task. Muscle is the engine that drives that task. So if you've got birds that have no muscle, it's not to say those birds won't roll and won't roll fast, but they're never going to be able to achieve the velocity that we look for. So that's what that muscle is for. It's for driving that roll. That's right. And also for the brakes too. You know, you... Again, for the brakes. Yeah. Being able to stop that roll. Because once you get birds that roll with a high velocity, guess what? Being able to come out of that roll, if you've ever watched a bird that goes into a roll, goes into it at a great velocity, and then you watch halfway through the roll, the bird sputters and, and, and you see it jerking, that bird's trying to get out of that roll. Right. And it doesn't have the brakes. And a lot of times when the birds don't have that break, the brakes, they continue and boom, they slam. They can't pull out of the roll. It's not that the bird miscalculated. It does not have what it needs to complete its given task. It doesn't have the muscle to maintain that speed. It doesn't have the muscle to stop and come out of that roll, nor the willingness sometimes. So what are some of the influences and the people that influence you coming up as a young man reading free raising pigeons well the first one was homer coderre okay but, but how old Ho is homer now homer is going to turn 101 on january the 21st wow 100 years old yeah 101 and and he's he's got all his faculties i mean uh last last year i went over to his house after he had turned 100 and he said, Richard, do you remember back in the 70s you gave me a red checker hen, a band number 193, and how good that bird uh, did in my stock? And, and I said, Homer, how in the hell does a person 
a hundred years old remember a band number? And he says, well, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> but he, he has got his brain still. He remembers everything. And, and most people, as, even when they get to be my age, you start losing it, you know. But uh, he's, he's got his memory. When you say your age, what would that be? 74. 74. How long, how, how many years, or should I say, when, how old were you when you started raising rollers? In the mid-70s. Nice, nice, nice. But once I crossed that Platts cock into the stock, the Platts cock was, was a large muscular bird, and that intensified the speed. So I suspected right away that that, uh, that was the thing that was doing it. So mm -hmm. as I bred through the years, and I brought in some mining Nebo birds. Uh, I brought in, I don't know, a lot of different, a lot of different bloodlines. I kept that muscle in there, mm -hmm. and and so what I did, I developed a family. I developed, say, a dozen different families that have different mixtures, mm -hmm. but they're all equal as far as what they throw. Right. And I also learned that if you have a bird this long. It won't, it won't handle that speed, right. but if you make it this long, you shorten it up a little bit, the balance is better, and it will, it will handle the speed. So let's, let, let's, let's talk about balance, let's talk about body type, all the things that we do and breed for to make that quality roll. But one of the things that I really want to talk about and I really want to get into is your system of breeding because as roller men um, we have done things a long time a certain way and yours is completely different and it, it's, it's odd but it's completely different than what we've all been taught and what we understand to be but your results speak for themselves so I'll ask you a couple questions one do you stop a large percentage of your birds from the kit that you fly. No. Did you hear that? That was was a resounding no, in that he doesn't stop from the air. Now, when you first told me this, it made me scratch my head, because I said either he's crazy or lost it, but everyone stops from the air. He does not, and his results are still the same. Another thing, so we went through his, his breeding loft and I asked him, out of these birds, how many of these birds have been flown and stocked from the air? And he said, no, no, very few, if any. They hadn't been flown. Now, obviously, you have to start at some point with birds that have been flown. That's right. But you get to a point, or should I say you've gotten to a point where these birds that you are breeding from have been flown. Now, one of the things you said that really, really piqued my curiosity, and it's one of those things that I wrestled with and went back and forth and back and forth, is that as roller men, we have been taught to pick from the air to breed. You don't do that. No. When, and this is one of the things that you said that really blew me away. When we breed flyers, the process we use to breed birds that we're gonna fly and the process we use to breed birds that we're going to breed are completely opposite, they're separate. That's correct. So think about that. The birds that we use to make flyers and the birds that we use to make breeders, which produce the flyers, are two separate processes. Now, let's elaborate. When you're making breeders, now just so our audience understands, these are birds that you're making in order to breed it at a later point. These are not birds that you're going to fly. Tell me what that process involves. Okay, well, of course you have to have the right ingredients. You've got to get the right engine in the birds. Meaning, uh, meaning, meaning birds that already have quality roll, birds that already have the muscle, right? And they're proven to produce. Key point, birds that are key that are proven to produce. What he's saying is, just because a bird flies and rolls well, doesn't mean he's gonna produce it. So that's why the process for making a breeder is not the same 
as making a flyer. Because a breeder has to do what? It has to produce and has to reproduce the quality birds that it is. A flyer, the bird that you picked out of the air, he may be a great flyer, but you don't know if he's going to reproduce it. How many times have you put two great birds together and they haven't produced anything? They haven't produced junk. They produced junk. They didn't produce birds that were as good as they were because those birds were flyers. Those birds were not breeders. They were not producers. And that's what really turned things on my head for me when he said this. Because, again, the route to producing breeders and the route to producing flyers are separate. So uh, a lot of people produce flyers, but like, like Sam says, some of the flyers won't produce. And the old method is fly a bird for three years. Three years. Now, you fly a bird for three years, it does not produce. You've wasted three years. Definitely. Okay? So, if you can focus on what you breed in the loft and make sure that, that even one pair that you start with, they produce producers, and their youngsters will produce these birds that will be great kit birds, then you've accomplished more because it's, it's much more important to produce producers than great flyers because the producers will produce those. Exactly, exactly. So just let me uh, recap on what he said. It's much more important to produce birds that will produce great producers than it is to produce birds that will produce great flyers. Flyers are expendable because just because a bird's a great flyer doesn't mean it's going to produce birds that are great flyers. If you have birds that produce breeders, they produce producers. So it's like producing the factory opposed to producing the workers. That's right. That's a good analogy to, you know, if you want to continue in business, you need to produce something that produces the factory, not produces the workers. Flyers are the workers. Everything that we want to do is going to be geared toward producing birds that will produce great workers. So, in order to do that, we talked a little bit about a muscle cock. Now, what's the importance of having a muscle cock in a, in a mating? Well, the muscle gets transferred into the youngsters. Okay. And, uh, and for me, the muscle cock is, is really the key. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a muscle cock and a muscle hen... Uh, you're making the birds just a little bit too strong. Uh, so what happens when you, if I, if say I take a cock that's a muscle cock and I take a hen that has a lot of muscle too and I put those two together, shouldn't I get just super fast birds in my kit? Well, you would think that, but that's not always the case. And it can happen, uh -huh. but a lot of times uh, you just hit a disaster zone where they're just going to come down on you. Okay, so it's a little too much. It's a little yeah. overload. Yeah. So how do you compensate for having too much muscle? Because too much muscle is not a bad thing, obviously. Yeah. Just how do you how do you regulate that? How do what, it's what? just experimentation. Okay. Now, no. so if I've got a muscle cock, what kind of hen am I putting on that muscle cock in order to produce flyers? You're putting uh, to produce flyers. You're putting a smaller hen, mm -hmm. maybe a medium-sized hen. Right. Uh, and she does not carry that type of muscle. But the hen is the one that controls the type. So, like I was telling you before, I've, I've taken different bloodlines and I've download, downloaded those bloodlines into one bird. Right. Okay? In, into a cockbird. And the cockbird is, is a long bird. Right. And then I take the short bird, the bird a hen, and I made it to that cock after I get everything I wanted to that cock bird. And I made the two together. She brings the type in. Right. She shortens up the type. And then there's better balance for the speed that they're going to have to handle. Nice. So again, let me just recap. You've got a cock with all the muscle. Muscle is transferred from the cock to the youngsters. You take a hen that is a finesse, which is going to be a smaller, more balanced bird breed it to that. Now what you're doing, you're producing flyers, correct? That's right. Okay, so that's going to produce you flyers. Now, I want to produce my breeders. Why wouldn't I use their babies for my breeders? Because uh, if you breed for kit birds, you, right. want, you want smaller birds. You don't right. want the larger birds. Okay. 
So you have to have a stock of larger hens, or at least a few of them, right. and larger cocks to produce the breeders. Okay, okay. So when I'm breeding birds to be breeders, I'm actually looking for the hen to carry muscle and the cock to carry muscle. That's right. That's awesome. Right. Okay, okay. So I hope we got that. So again, back to what he said, producing breeders, you're looking for muscle. Your base of your family is going to be in muscle. When you're producing flyers, you're going to take a finesse. Now, i got another question. When you take a, say, a very large hen that carries muscle on a cock that may be a little henny or a little small or the one that actually is finesse, how does that work out? Can you do it either way? I've done it that way uh, just out of necessity, but my comfort zone is always the other way. What, are your, what, are your, what were your results when you did it the other way? Were they it, just as... It worked. Oh, okay. It worked. Okay. But uh, it's, it would be hard for me to, to do both meth methods, so okay. I chose to use the Cox, and, and uh, that seems to work always. Awesome. Now, question. Um, so one of the things that we talked about, one of the things that you said, your, your ratio of percentage of quality birds. Now, a good percentage of quality birds, you figure some guys, say, say you breed uh, four kits, say five kits a year, you know, you had 100 birds, you know, 20, or tw just say, say 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, five kits, 20 birds each, right? So if you're breeding five kits a year, and out of those five kits, your conventional wisdom says you should be able to make one really solid kit from those hundred birds. Right. Now, you, if you breed a hundred birds, how many of those birds do you think are going to be solid birds? Almost a hundred percent using that method. Now, wait a minute. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> so with his method, if he's breeding a hundred birds... About 90 to 100 percent are going to be solid birds. When you say solid bird, what do you mean? Well, I don't, I don't cherry pick birds uh, for my kits. I just get so many flying bodies in each kit, and they all come in. So basically, what he's saying is, he breeds a kit. That kit stays together, and his percentage is 80 to 100 percent quality. Now, how did you get there? Because if I breed a hundred birds, I create a kit from those hundred. I don't just leave them like that. And each kit is not a kit unto itself. It's a goal to make one solid kit that's a competition kit. What you're telling me is the quality is the same across the board with those five kits. That's right. So your percentage of rollers would have to be 80 to 100 percent? Conventional wisdom tells us, and what I've experienced, and most of the guys I know that have experienced, is when you breed a hundred birds, you pick and make a kid out of that. So, if you figure you're breeding, your breeding ratio would have to be, for the average guy, 60% of his birds on a good day, 60% of the birds are quality. The other 40%, you're going to have to call, and they're going to go through. With yours, what you're saying is your quality ratio is 80 to 100 percent. You don't have a whole lot of calls. Yeah, and if there's a problem, if you have a bird that's not quite up to par, you go back to the producers you go back and to your try breeding. to figure out what you did wrong. So, what is the one thing that you would say that translated into that high ratio of quality birds versus where you were before? Or the one few, the couple things, that whatever, you tell me. It's really hard to answer. The, the thing is, uh, you have to put in a lot of hours, mm -hmm. always, in your breeding loft. Uh, you need to watch the kit birds, just like everybody watches kit birds, but the most important thing that you can do is is to produce the top producing uh, birds in your loft. Right. So that's where you really have to put your time. If you hate to breed, you're not going to make it. Uh, it just, you know, I worked, I worked on my stock 40 years, and I used to have long birds and short birds and right. 
fat birds and skinny birds and whatever. But uh, I finally had to keep watching those and lock into the right types. And then I created families that carry different families. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll put a pair together and they'll, they'll carry a different mixture than another pair that I'll put together. And that goes throughout the loft. Right. And uh, that way I never ever have to inbreed or line breed. I always outcross. So one of the things that I want to do besides this conversation is give you guys an example of type. I want to give you an uh, example of what Richard looks for. And, you know, over the time that I've known Richard, we've looked at birds together and he knows what he's looking for and I know what he's looking for. Because it's funny, because a lot of times what I'm looking at and what he's looking at, they coincide. And we're talking about the exact same birds. So we're going to take a quick break and we're going to go down there and we're going to pull out a couple birds and we're going to go and talk about type. Okay, so guys, we were talking about earlier about type. And uh, in Richard's birds, uh, we want to go a little more into depth. So we talked about a muscle cock. What is a muscle cock? Here is an example of that bird. One of the things I want you to realize, look at this. It's almost like a pyramid shape. There's nothing on from my thumb forward or from my thumb this way. There's nothing there. All the bird's weight is concentrated here. It's almost like a... Oh, like a like a like an avocado shape. It's all right here. This is a muscle cock. Let me show you what this bird looks like in the in the cage. Look at that. That is beautiful. Beautiful. Look at where the bird's body weight is is concentrated. It's directly dead in the center. Over here is another example. A beautiful example. Again, from my thumb forward, there's nothing there. It's all right here, just like an avocado. Just beautiful, just a beautiful example. Really, really expressive eye, great shape. Beautiful, beautiful bird and a proven producer. So look at that, just amazing, beautiful, beautiful bird. So these are two cock birds. These birds are producers. Then right next to it here is a hen, and this hen is a little larger hen. This is going to be a producer. So you, when you're producing birds, as Richard states, you want to look for birds that are going to be a little larger and carry muscle too. That is for producing breeders. Now if you're producing birds that are going to be kit birds, off of a pair, which is going to be a muscle cock and a smaller hen, what you're going to be mating that muscle cock to is a finesse bird, a bird that is very small. And if you look at that, look, look, at, look at how slender that bird is in my hand. Very, very, very small bird. And again, you got to generate speed, so you got to have the type. And if you look at this bird, very small all around. Beautiful, beautiful bird. So you put that type of bird to a bird like this to produce your flyers, correct Richard? Yes. So if you look at that, that's what's going to produce you your flyers. Now there's something else I wanted to, to talk about and we watched Richard's birds fly and one of the things that I noticed about his birds, if you look at if you look at the tail, or should I say the lack thereof, look at this. Has that ever happened to your birds? That is some serious velocity. His birds roll so fast that they burn their tails off and their feathers become completely tattered. When I first saw this, I said, Jesus Christ, they're in horrible condition. And then I realized what was causing it. It was actually the roll. The birds roll so fast that they burn the feathers off. So that's something to strive for. Birds that you roll, that roll so fast that the feathers fly off of them. And I've seen it again and again. Birds that come out of the kick cage, they're in pristine condition, they go up and they come back and they're completely frazzled. That's because of the roll was so vicious, so hard, at such high velocity, 
and that's what we all strive for, to breed birds that are going to roll like this. I mean, look at this bird. It's a tiny little bird. It's hardly anything here. But I watched this bird fly today, and you'll see in the video, you'll see this bird fly. And, uh, you know, one of the other things that I always look for, if you look at this, this wing is straight across. There's no bow to the wing. That right there, in my estimation, in my experience, contributes to velocity. Look at that, Richard. Exactly what I was talking about. And this is one of the fastest birds in the kit. And it's straight across. There's no bow to it. It's straight. So, um, another bird that... Again, if you look at this bird in the wing, it has a little less bow. It, has, it does have some bow to it. It's not as straight. And you look at the tail. The tail of this bird is not as bad. Guess what? One of the things about this bird, when you compare this one to the black, the black was much faster. Yeah. Much faster bird. So again, when you look at your birds and you see those tails and you see that tail's completely trashed, it's doing something right. And this is a younger bird too. Younger bird too. Much younger. So, just a, 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 a 411 on type on breeding strategy as far as muscle cocks, a muscle hen, and finesse birds like this one in my hand. So do you mind if I say something to Oh yeah, say? sure, go ahead. People people talk about getting a bird that's related to a muscle cock. Every mating requires a muscle cock. Not related to a muscle cock. You gotta have every single mating uh, containing a muscle cock, okay? And I'm not in, in the business of selling birds. I don't sell birds. I raise the birds for myself. And what the only reason I do stuff like this is to share the knowledge with you guys. I don't profit from it in any way at all. It's just for you because I was able to do it and it works and it's for you. Awesome. Awesome. One of the things people have, have, have asked me is, you know, why do we raise rollers? And I'm pretty sure that the reason that Richard raises rollers and the reason that I raise rollers are the same. For me, I know it's to improve, to improve the quality of rollers out there. One thing, to improve the quality of rollers out there. To make sure that we breed the fastest and the best birds that we can. And if you can't improve the quality of birds out there, you shouldn't be raising birds. You know what I mean? End of story. What's, what, why do you breed rollers, Richard? I just, you know, tried them years ago, and I, I love them. I started off with shell birds mm -hmm. and started getting off into genetic projects. And then I met Homer Coderre. And Homer, uh, I saw the quality that he was raising over there. And I think that that's really what stimulated me. Awesome. Um, for me, I uh, actually saw my first rollers when I was very, very young and was just completely taken aback by mm -hmm. birds that did this, that flipped. And then I met a guy by the name of uh, Don Buckner, and he actually raised kings. And from there, he had a, a muff tumbler, it was actually a roller because it rolled down and he crossed it with his kings. He put it he put it in his loft to let it get well so he could take it to the pet shop, but it mated with one of his birds. And because if you understand a little bit about genetics, hybridization, when you bring two different breeds together, what it creates is variety. Hybridization creates variety. So what happened, he had all kings that were one breed, he brought in a West of England muff, it crossed, and what he produced was birds that were bigger than his kings, and they were muffed. So he fell in love with the offspring and started breeding those, and I was interested in the hen, so I got a pair off the hen, and it was crazy, these birds flew. I mean, they flew great, but they were, you know, they didn't roll. So from there, I was interested in rollers. I ended up meeting a gentleman by the name of uh, Charles Robinson, and some of my viewers may know him. And he had, as a matter of fact, he was in the MCRC club, which is no longer around, but uh, he had some amazing birds. His birds were 
basically uh, Smith birds. They went. Uh, uh, one of his friends that lived down the street was a guy by the name of Johnny Isabel, and Johnny Isabel and Charles showed me a whole world that I never knew existed as far as with rollers, and uh, that was pretty much the beginning for me, and I, I have stuck with rollers ever since. Okay. Uh, I, I wanted to mention before we close that, you know, we're talking about certain types that you need to maintain, and you need to maintain the types because God created the wild type, okay? And uh, I'm a believer in God. Okay, so, but the wild type is within our birds. And our birds want to stretch out and become these ugly things that we see in the streets. And we have to continuously uh, keep that in mind and watch the birds as they try to go back to what evolution tells them to go back to. And we need to... Uh, Fight against that and keep the, the the basic roller type always. Right. So type being extremely important. Like Richard said, you have to pay attention to type. We talk about body type. We talk about the shape of the bird, overall conformation, stance, balance. All that is included in type. Eye color. It's all included in type. So again, thank you, Richard, for participating in our series, Bird's Eye View. And we look forward to having more conversations. And um, that's it, guys. Thanks for, uh, for watching. Uh, remember to hit the like button, uh, ask questions, and remember, you only know what you know.